Um, the next speaker will be Herbert Rondon talking about urea as a medication to treat hyponatremia. And um, I shortly introduce Dr. Rondon. He is an associate professor of medicine at the, in the renal electrolyte division at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And uh, he has also obtained a master of science degree in medical education. He has published several manuscripts in the area of hyponatremia. That's why he's asked to give this presentation. And uh, so we're looking forward to hear your recommendations on that and your experience. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. And I'd like to thank Dr. Kotanko and the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today about this topic. Um, and thank you for, to the audience that have, you know, I think I'm the last talk of the day, of the, the whole meeting, and uh, thank you for staying until the end. I want to put my talk into perspective because this is a dialysis conference where m you have heard many experts talking about ways to remove uh, molecules from dialysis patients, uh, including, of course, urea, which is a, one of the better study molecules. I'm going to talk to you about how to put urea back into, into patients to treat hyponatremia. So uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, the learning objectives for today are to uh, explain the mechanism of action of urea and hyponatremia. Um, also, we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the use of urea uh, in hyponatremia. And finally, give you some uh, data on how to identify certain patients that might benefit from treatment with urea. So I'm going to start with a case. Um, this is a 72-year-old woman uh, that I saw in the hospital. Uh, she was admitted uh, after a fall and developed a fracture of her, her right hip. And uh, you were consulted to see her for hyponatremia. Her plasma sodium was 126. Her medical history was significant for bronchiectasis and osteoarthritis. And she doesn't take a lot of medications, only uh, acetaminophen and a multivitamin. And this is uh, her physical exam. As you see, her blood pressure and her right are uh, within normal limits. Her cardiopulmonary exam is normal. She has this uh, device that is allowing uh, extension traction of her right leg. No edema on exam, and neurologically, she appears intact, uh, alert and oriented with no deficits. And these are her labs. So her sodium, as you see, is 126. Her viewing was 9. Uh, creatinine was 0.7. Her urine also awesome was uh, 265 decrease. Her uric acid was low, 2.6. Her TSH was within the normal limits. They also check a cortisol, which was 23 uh, micrograms per deciliter, effectively ruling out adrenal insufficiency. And her urine studies on the right, uh, you see her urine sodium was elevated at 72, uh, and her urine osmium awesome was elevated also at 318. So uh, based on this presentation, you know, um, the question that I have for the audience uh, is, in addition to fluid restriction, what is the best step in the management of these patients hyponatremia? And you have no, no additional therapy, urea, normal saline, or hypertonic saline. And we'll, we'll review the, um, the question at the end of the talk. Um, so, and the other question that I have is, uh, which of the following is an advantage of using urea for hyponatremia? And you have four uh, choices. Urea allows for discontinuation of fluid restriction. B, urea decreases the risk of overly rapid correction of hyponatremia. C, urea decreases the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. And D, urea improves morbidity and mortality. So we'll review the, uh, these questions at the end of the talk. So I just want to give you a timeline of the use of urea as a therapy in, in medicine. So. Um, the first use to describe in the literature was uh, late 1800s, where, where urea was used uh, for the first time as a diuretic in Germany. Um, and then uh, in the 1950s, uh, there was a neurosurgeon, uh, Manu Cher Jabet, in the University of um, um, Wisconsin, Madison, who actually started using urea to treat uh, increased intracranial hypertension. Uh, Dr. Stevens. Uh, did a, a wonderful talk earlier about uh, urea um, transport in the, uh, in the brain. And so urea has some osmotic properties in the brain. So it was used uh, 
to treat intracranial hypertension uh, in these patients, also to treat glaucoma for the same reasons. But in the 1961, uh, Manitol was introduced, and then in 1975, they stopped using urea altogether and just switched to Manitol because there were some issues with urea, including it, was very, it wasn't very stable to store, so they just moved to Manitol. And the first use of urea in hyponatremia started in the early 1980s, where uh, a group in Belgium uh, led by Guy de Caux uh, started using urea for patients with uh, SIDH, and they have published many reports of this uh, throughout the, until to, about 2000s. And in 2014, uh, there was um, a European guidelines that was released, uh, and uh, the European guidelines for hyponatremia actually recommend urea as the second light therapy for hyponatremia from SIDH uh, after fluid restriction. Uh, in 2016, urea became available in the U.S., um, commercially available, I would say, because there were some pharmacies that were able to compound urea, and some physicians were using it, but commercially available become, became available in 2016. And uh, in 2018, we, my group in the University of Pittsburgh, we published the first report of the use of urea for inpatient hyponatremia. So urea is a uh, molecule that has a molecular weight of 60 grams per mole, and it comes available in the U.S., at least in these uh, powder packets that have this sweet citrus flavor in contrast to the European formulation that is more bitter. Uh, and the FDA actually doesn't consider urea as a, a medication. It considers it as a supplement. So you don't need a prescription. You can go online and buy it from a website, you know, and the patients can do that under the direction of their nephrologist. Now I'll just give you a basic pharmacokinetics of urea. Uh, so urea is mostly absorbed in the upper GI tract. About 96% of it is reabsorbed or more and distributes in total body water. In muscle, urea equilibrates very quickly within an hour, but in the brain, as Dr. Stevens uh, pointed earlier, it takes some time for urea to equilibrate and it can actually have an osmotic property if you give urea to these patients. Uh, it takes about 10 hours in the, in the blood-brain barrier to equilibrate. And as I said, most of the urea is reabsorbed in the, uh, in the proximal GI tract, but very little end up in the colon, where that small amount of urea actually can be metabolized by bacteria in the colon to uh, ammonium. And this might constitute a theoretical uh, concern for some patients with liver disease, where you give a lot of urea, they can actually develop a lot of ammonia, and perhaps develop a, an episode of hepatic encephalopathy. Um, urea is freely filtered by the glomerulus, and about 30 to 50% is excreted in the urine and change, and the half-life is about two and a half hours. So if you give a dose of urea in 12 hours, everything will be out of your system. So just to give you some, um, uh, an idea of how the kidney handles urea, so uh, this is an schematic of the uh, nephron and and you can see here in red uh, the descending base recta and the ascending base recta that basically are in charge of um, uh, the contracurrent exchanger trying to maintain the, medullary, the cortical medullary gradient. Um, and you have on the, on the left side uh, an schematic of the nephron where urea is uh, filtered. And uh, at the end of the proximal tubule, about 50% of the urea will remain inside the lumen because the proximal tubule reabsorbs about half of the urea that is filtered. And then uh, starting the thick ascending limb, uh, you have about 110% now of the filtered urea. And the reason for that is because there is urea, as you know, in the medulla that is going to be recycled. There are these urea TA2 transporters that are going to uh, basically uh, excrete urea back into the lumen, so that will increase the urea into the uh, early thick ascending limb. And some of the urea also uh, basically follows uh, the base recta and the countercurrent exchanger is secreted back into the descending base recta by these urea TB transporters. Now, there is also some urea that will be secreted back through the thin ascending limb. Uh, the transporters are unknown at this point. And now this uh, blue area from the thick ascending limb until the end of the outer medulla, or outer medullary collecting duct, is a uh, segment of the nephron that has very low permeability for urea. Um, but nevertheless, at the end of the uh, cortical, uh, out the outer medullary collecting duct, the urea inside the lumen is only 
And uh, some urea is actually reabsorbed in the inner medullary collecting duct by these urea transporters uh, A1, which is apical, and A3, which is basolateral, back into the uh, medulla, about 20%, resulting in 30% of urea that is excreted. Um, now, the area where urea would work as an osmotic diuretic in the kidneys is this area. Um, which constitutes basically the connecting tubule, the cortical connecting duct, and the um, outer medullary collecting duct that has a low permeability for urea, but it has a high permeability of, for water. Remember, the aquaporin-2 is present in these segments. Uh, theoretically, there could be some uh, diffusion of the gradient through the urea transporters in the inner medulla. However, the UTA1 transporter is very saturable, so a high dose of urea, it will, not, it will get saturated and basically uh, urea can actually work as an osmotic diuretic there as well. So a way to understand how urea works is by understanding this principle in renal physiology that says that the uh, water clearance depends on solute excretion. So this is a graph that shows on the y-axis free water clearance on, on the x-axis, the different urine osmolalities. And the three curves that you can see there are basically curves of daily solute excretion. The top curve is 300 milliosms per day, so a low solute excretion. Middle curve is 600, and the high curve would be 900. So um, this, when the person is in solute balance, could easily be interchanged by daily solute intake. So if, when you have a patient who is eating uh, a diet that contains only 300 milliosms per day at a maximally diluted urine of 50 milliosms. The amount of free water that they can excrete is only five liters. But if you increase your diet and you start eating 600 milliosms per day, you can increase the clearance up to 10 liters. And if you do 900 milliosms per day, then your clearance will be up to 15 liters. So the more solutes you ingest, the more likely you're going to increase the uh, water clearance. Now, uh, quantitatively, we also can illustrate this point by looking at what happens in different scenarios, normal patients and patients with SIDH treated with different therapies. Uh, for instance, in the top row here, you have a patient who is ingesting 700 milliosomes of solute per day and is drinking two liters of water per day. Uh, if the patient is in a solute balance, the amount of solutes in the diet will be the same as the solute excretion in the urine. And if the patient is in water balance, the same amount of water intake will actually appear in the urine, so two liters. So you can calculate, actually, the urine osmolality just by dividing the number of osmos in the urine divided by the volume. So if we do that simple operation, uh, in urine osmolality would be 700 divided by two, that would be a urine osmolality of 350 milliosmos per liter. Now, the water balance in, for this patient would be zero because he's drinking two liters and he's excreting two liters. Now, what happens in SIDH? So in SIDH, the same uh, diet in the uh, 700 milliosomes per day, the same water intake, two liters, but now patients with SIDH have a, an elevated urine osmolality. But not only that, it's elevated, but it's considered fixed, which means that it's not going to change based on your solute or, or water intake. So I can rearrange this equation here. So the volume goes into the, uh, on the uh, left side, and the urine osmolality goes into the denominator to calculate what would be the urine volume in this patient. So if you divide the number of osm, which would be 700, divided by the urine osmolality would be 500, then you'll have that the patient will make 1.4 liters of urine. But the patient is drinking two liters of urine, of water, so that means that the water balance would be at the end 0.6 liters positive. So this patient will develop hyponatremia because he's retaining water. Now, if you treat this patient with a regular regimen, uh, typical regimen of salt tablets, which for most of the, the nephrologists, at least in the US, is two grams three times a day, so six grams a day, you're only added to the intake 205 milliosomes of solute. So if you calculate uh, what would be the urine volume based on that solute intake? It would be 905, which is 700 from the diet plus 205 from the salt tablets, divided by 500, which is the urine osmolarity. So your urine volume will be only 1.8 liters. So at the end of the day, you're still retaining 0.2 liters of, of water, and the hyponatremia hasn't improved much. It's better than not giving anything at all, but still not optimal. But if you give this patient 
with SIDH 30 grams of urea per day, which is 500 millimoles or milliosomes, then you're increasing the solute intake up to 1,200. If you calculate the urine volume, 1,200 divided by 500, then you are actually eliminating 2.4 liters of water. And if you're drinking two, you are in negative water balance of 0.4 liters. And that's how urea works in hyponatremia, by increasing solute uh, load in these patients. All right, what about the data supporting the use of urea in hyponatremia? There are no randomized control trials, but there have been many uh, observational studies, and these are the list of the, all the observational studies that have been done. As you see, most of them are observational. Most of them don't have a control group, and most of them actually have small number of patients. The largest one was the last before the, the last one, which is Lockett, 69 patients. Uh, and if you look at the outcomes, they look at different outcomes. Some of them look at final plasma sodium. Some of them look at uh, change of plasma sodium in 24 hours. And some of them look at, as you see at the end, normalization of sodium. And the duration of urea therapy has been very variable from two days or one day up to a year. So these are very, all over the place. But nevertheless, all of these studies show that urea is effective and uh, in treating hyponatremia. Now, we did a study in Pittsburgh uh, looking at our experience over one year using urea when it was approved for the inpatient formulary. And as you see there, uh, most of the patients were elderly, 60 years old. Most of them were men. The most common etiology of hyponatremia, as you can imagine, it was SIDH, although this wasn't mutually, mutually exclusive. There were patients who have more than one cause of hyponatremia. And uh, this group of patients, 58 total, uh, they receive urea, but they also receive other therapies for hyponatremia, like fluid restriction, salt tablets, and loop diuretics. Now, when we look at a group of patients from this cohort, only 12 who had SIDH and who only received urea as the only drug therapy for hyponatremia, we see in here that the plasma sodium improved at 24 hours and at the end of therapy about a difference of five, change in plasma sodium, five or six. The BUN as expected went up and the creatinine remained the same and the urine osmolarity also uh, remained about the same. And the urine sodium, actually, there was a trend towards decreasing. And this has been shown in other studies. Actually, uh, SIDH, uh, the mechanism of hyponatremia, is not just water retention. It's also due to, uh, uh, there is a compensatory uh, naturesis that happened in SIDH. So these patients have a decrease in total body sodium as well. And um, in other studies, they have shown that when you give urea, you don't only increase water excretion, but you also cause a positive sodium balance in these patients with SIDH. So another mechanism why urea might help in SIDH. Now, uh, we compare our group that was treated with urea, the 12 patients with SIDH, with a group historical control that wa was seen by us a year before when urea wasn't available in our institution. And when we compare, them, the plasma sodiums were similar at baseline, and 24 hours actually the group that received urea had a, a higher increase uh, of plasma sodium compared to the uh, untreated urea group that controls. But at the end of the treatment, there was no change or difference in the, in the change in, ure, in plasma sodium. There was a slight trend towards normalization of sodium in the group that received urea, and the length of hospital stay was about the same as well. Now, what about the use of urea compared to other therapies? You know that one of the therapies that is supported by randomized control trials are the Baptans. And uh, in, um, the group in Belgium did a study where uh, they actually look at patients who were already treated with urea that have normal plasma sodiums, and they asked these patients, a, a group of 13 patients, to stop the urea, and that allowed for the patients to become hyponatremic again. And after a washout period of about eight days, um, I'm sorry, these patients were, were on Baptans and the Baptans were stopped. And then after the Baptans were stopped, they asked them to t take urea and the sodium went up again and stay up for a period of over a year without any significant side effects. So these studies suggest that Baptans and urea are equally effective, at least in this quasi-experimental design. What about uh, side effects with urea? One of the concerns with any therapy for hyponatremia is overly rapid correction, and urea is not the exception. Uh, this, is, this study uh, published by the uh, Belgian group, the uh, Guy Deco, 
uh, studied 35 patients with severe hyponatremia, less than 115, and they were treated with urea, and they saw that in about 30 percent of patients, there was an overly rapid correction of, of hyponatremia, more than 12, uh, but they didn't observe any evidence of osmotic demyelination syndrome. Now, the uh, co-founders here are that, first of all, these are a group that are already at risk for developing overly rapid correction because their plasma sodium is very low. Number two, at least a third of these patients were also diagnosed of thiazide-induced hyponatremia. And also, these patients receive, as you can see from the graph here, isotonic saline. So if you are receiving uh, isotonic saline and you have thiazide-induced hyponatremia, then it's likely that the sodium might overly rapid correct. So there are some co-founders that don't necessarily uh, explain um, um, why urea would be the only reason in this particular case. There is another study that also showed about 10% rate of overly rapid correction with urea, but no cases of osmotic demyelination has been reported in the literature so far. Now, even if urea can cause osmotic can cause overly rapid correction of hyponatremia, there is some data that shows that urea can be protective against osmotic demyelination syndrome. This is was a study done um, by uh, the cause group uh, where they actually had animals who uh, were overcorrected with either hypertonic saline, lisibaptan, or urea. And as you see there, the change in plasma sodium is similar for those three groups. But when they look at the neurological manifestations after the overly rapid correction, you see that in green, when they're corrected with urea, uh, the animals have a score that is high, which means that they are not that compromised neurologically. But when you have a very low score, means that the animals are almost comatose. And you see when they overcorrect with lisibaptan or with hypertonic, the animals are almost comatose there. And when you look at survival, and this group of animals, if you are overcorrected with urea, you survive much longer compared to if you were overcorrected with hypertonic or with uh, lisibaptan. Well, what about other side effects? So one of the common side effects of urea is the distaste. People don't like the flavor, even with the American formulation, although it's alleviated. So 10 to 15 percent of distaste has been reported with urea because it's a little bitter nausea and vomiting, headaches, and uh, diarrhea as well. In Belgium, actually, they have, uh, to prevent the distaste that uh, is caused by urea, they have this Brussels champagne where they mix urea with sodium bicarbonate, citric acid, and sucrose to, com to make it more palatable for patients to drink. Um, so that's actually one thing that they do in, in Belgium. Now, I mentioned that in 2014, the European guidelines actually uh, recommend the use of urea as a second line therapy for hyponatremia of SIDH after fluid restriction. And this is the statement where they said basically, uh, in moderate profound hyponatremia, we suggest as a second line therapy either uh, urea or the combination of loop diuretics with salt tablets. And they actually recommend against the use of uh, baptans. Uh, the American guidelines from 2013, a year before, actually, they do recommend for uh, the use of baptans. But the European, in contrast to the Americans, are, didn't agree with that necessarily, based on the data. So what would be the indications and contraindications for urea? So the most common indication, I would say, is SIDH. And when, when you have uh, non-severe symptoms, so if you have severe symptoms, certainly hypertonic saline will be the choice, but if you are you don't have any significant symptoms, urea can be used. Heart failure is another indication, although depending on the cardiac output, if it's very low, urea will not get fil uh, filtered inside the uh, nephron, so it won't work. Now, contraindications, and I would say a relative contraindication, is the concern of giving a patient with cirrhosis uh, a urea load that would be transformed into ammonium and potentially cause hepatic encephalopathy. This is a theoretical risk. Uh, there hasn't been any studies that have looked at this, you know, in a prospective fashion, so it's still unclear. And actually, on, I have used urea and cirrhotics in a few occasions as well with good results um, and with no encephalopathy. So it's, it's uh, something that you need to be aware of. Now, it's always been said that uh, the main therapy for uh, hyponatremia from SIDH is a fluid restriction. And uh, all the texts and art articles will mention this. However, most of the patients with SIDH will not respond to fluid restriction. So how do you know when a patient will respond versus they won't respond? 
Well, we use this uh, equation, the electrolyte free water clearance, to have an idea if the patient will or will not respond to fluid restriction. Basically, the equation will tell you how much free water is in the urine uh, every day, and you calculate it by multiplying the volume of urine in 24 hours times one minus uh, urine sodium plus urine potassium divided by plasma sodium. However, a lot of the times we don't have the urine volume, but you really don't need to have the urine volume. You can just look at that ratio between the urine electrolytes and the plasma sodium. It's called the urine to plasma electrolyte ratio. Some other people call it the first ratio based on the first author of the publication that described this. Uh, I just call it the UP ratio. And just for the trainees in the audience, just wanna go over how do you use this and what does it mean? So if your UP ratio is equal to one, then let's say somebody's making two liters of urine, the UP ratio is one. If you calculate the electrolyte free water clearance, it's gonna be zero. That means those two liters of urine that you are producing are isotonic to plasma. So you're not gaining or losing free water. These patients will not, uh, will not have any significant increase in plasma sodium. However, if your UP ratio is less than one, the same uh, numbers, so two liters of urine output, a UP ratio less than one of 0.5, you calculate the free water clearance, it's positive one liter. What does it mean? It means that of those two liters of urine, one liter is isotonic and the other liter is free water. So the patient is actually excreting free water in the urine, and if you give the patient less fluid intake than the sum of free water in the urine plus insensible losses, the plasma sodium should improve. And these are the patients that will respond to fluid restriction when they have SIDH. When the UP ratio is less than one, unfortunately, these are the minority of patients, less than 30%. What about when the UP ratio is more than one? So going over the same numbers, if the patient is making two liters of urine and the ratio is 1.5, greater than one, if you calculate the electrolyte free water clearance, it's gonna be negative one liter. What does it mean negative? Well, if you're making two liters of urine, that means the patient is actually retaining one liter of water and is excreting two liters of isotonic fluid plus the solutes of the liter that you retain. So this is a hypertonic urine. The patient most likely is not going to respond to fluid restriction if they have a ratio of more than one because they are actually actively retaining free water. And this actually has been validated in a study. Uh, they look at the, uh, what is the chances of uh, when you have a high urine sodium, which will effectively make your UP ratio more than one, to not respond to fluid restriction. And you see here, 91.3% specificity if your u urine sodium is more than 130, that this patient will not respond to fluid restriction. Another uh, parameter that you can look as a surrogate would be a high urine osmolarity, more than 500, will have an 87% specificity that this patient will not respond to fluid restriction. So you can use this UP ratio to estimate if somebody will or will not respond when they have SIDH. What about the dose of urea? So the dose has been uh, uh, estimated 0.25 to 0.5 grams per kilogram per day, but the usual doses that we have available are 15, 30, and 60. However, I should say that the higher the urine osmolarity, the more urea you'll need to excrete the same amount of free water. And in a recent study done um, by Lockett, uh, shows that if you, leave, if you give the patient less than 30 grams a day, those patients more likely will not normalize their plasma sodium. So you have to give at a minimum 30 grams of urea per day to be able to normalize your sodium by 72 hours. So this is an approach that I use in my practice. So basically, in a patient with SIDH, you look at the UP ratio or the urine osmolarity. If the UP ratio is less than one or the urine osmolarity is less than 500, more likely that this patient will respond to fluid restriction alone, and that's all you need to do. You put them on some fluid restriction, 0.8 to one liters per day. However, if the patient doesn't meet this criteria, unlikely that they will respond to fluid restriction alone, and you can give, start them on urea, uh, and if the urine osmolarity is less than 500, I usually start with 30 grams a day, divided in 15 doses, 15 twice a day. And if it has a more than 500 urine osmolarity, I usually start with 30 grams twice a day. So in the patient that I showed you at the beginning, the UP ratio actually was less than one. And uh, this is a talk about urea, but urea is not necessarily the answer. Actually, the answer was you don't need anything else. You just put them on fluid restriction because this patient, based on the UP ratio and the urine awesome, would likely respond to fluid restriction alone. Mm -hmm.
And the second question is, the right answer is that urea decreases the risk of osmotic demyelination syndrome. At least there is a few studies that shows in animal, in animal data that urea actually is protective. Uh, and this might explain why we don't see a lot of demyelination in dialysis patients who usually run high BUNs, even when they overcorrect with dialysis. Uh, it's a, it's, no, there are not many cases reported about this in dialysis patients. This might be the explanation for it. So finally, the take home messages are that urea works in hyponatremia by producing osmotic diuresis. That urea has been shown, at least in retrospective studies, that is effective, safe, and well tolerated. And finally, that urea's main indication is SIDH, when flu restriction alone is expected to fail, has failed, or is not tolerated. And with that, thank you for your attention.